Welcome to It's All About the Questions, where learning to ask the right questions can help you achieve lifelong success. Now, here to help you ask all the right questions is award-winning author, international speaker, and business strategist, Laura Stewart. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. It's so exciting to be here with you again this week, and I'm getting much better at doing the Zoom and hitting all the recording buttons and all of that other stuff. And I'm just excited that I get to be here with you each week to present to you some of my amazing, amazing guests. And last week, I promised you this fantastic guest. Last week, I had Jocelyn Carbonara, um, my editor, who was on talking about publishing, about editing, about getting your story out of you. And I said her fantastic husband was going to be on this week, and he is. And you can see him on the screen on the other side of, of this video. And I've got Scott Carbonara on the show today. And we're going to do something really special today. Well, every week is kind of special because I get to be here with you and help you shift your perspectives. But one of the things that we really are seeing a lot that I'm seeing a lot right now with everything going on with COVID and with businesses and the shifts and the pivots is what's happening to people working from home. And Scott Carbonara is here. He is known as, and I love this, Scott, the leadership therapist. I mean, you were a crisis counselor. You were um, the executive team leading a multi, is it multi-million or multi-billion dollar healthcare company. You, you shifted them from... Uh, what was it, like 30 or 40 percent attrition to like 6 percent? I mean, talk about shifting employee engagement. Right now, the fear in so many people I talk to, Scott, is they're afraid of not working 24-7 because they feel like they have to justify their existence to their bosses who are further away. I mean, are you seeing this? I mean, you've got this massive experience in this, but hey, and number one, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thanks for having me. So, I mean, what are what are you seeing with this? Harvard Business Review just had an article written by Microsoft with the data they were seeing as to um, what Microsoft has seen since work from home started. It's pretty insane what they're talking about. Four hours more being worked. Right. Right. Yeah, I think I would liken this to the recession and financial crisis of more than 10 years ago, that uh, you stop looking about making more money or even believing you're going to get promoted. The Keeping your job is the new promotion. Right. So if you have a job, you are going to work your tail off to make sure that you do nothing to rock the boat. And I think that kind of leads to why people are working those longer hours, more hours. A lot of them are grateful they have jobs and you can also be grateful and burning out at the same time. I think we're seeing a lot of that as well. Uh, a, a good friend of mine has a new job and his they had a, a layoff to help make the company be more profitable, which of course they're hoping that they can bring everybody back on later on. But I see a lot of companies also taking this opportunity to retool, reframe, get rid of some people who were perhaps not the best fits and using kind of COVID as an excuse for making those changes. But what I see in the last month, it wasn't so prevalent the first couple of months, this last month is stress that I've never seen on him before. And the tightness in his face, the being, and He's constantly working, and I feel like he's shrinking into himself. What do yeah. you What do you say as somebody who coaches leaders to that? I mean, how do we deal with that? <clears throat> yeah, I, I remind leaders in coaching and consulting all the time that this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, you use different muscles, and it requires a completely different type of resilience when you're in something for the long haul. And right now we're using all of our, our sprint, our fast twitch muscles to work as hard as we can, to be as productive as we can. Uh, but the question is, is it sustainable? And in the long term, it's clearly not. We've seen this before when we've had other sprints in the economy where people were you know, high insecurity, high fear. 
Um, those people that burn out, those people who are in organizations that keep laying off to get meaner and leaner, if employees don't feel taken care of, when the economy does rebound, uh, they'll be looking for a place to be loyal, but it won't necessarily be the place that they just work. Uh, that might be a bridge that they're going to burn to get something that looks like work-life balance in the long run. Okay, so you know you, you said a lot of different things in that, right? You said resiliency. You said um, sustainable. You you talked about the sprint versus the marathon. When I think of all those words and I look at my friends that are going through, they were corporate. These were not necessarily entrepreneurs that were just solo practitioners. These are people who have multiple employees or worked in a corporation. They don't know how to moderate that anymore. Some of them have worked from home for years, but the corporate group was a building. They went there maybe once a quarter or whatever, but now all of a sudden everybody's working from home and nobody seems to know how to balance that. I mean, I, I don't even know how to tell them how to balance it other than be aware of your time. So what do you say? You know, it's interesting. I started my career as a crisis counselor. I worked from home. So I had no difference between watching Saturday Night Live and then switching to finish writing a report, you know, right from the same couch with my feet on the same ottoman. Um, it's not for everyone. Those people, I think, that are having the biggest adjustment struggles are those who are in the office where they had the water cooler, they had the cafeteria, they had their coffee breaks with their friends because they got that social connection. Okay. Um, we know that that social piece, and even from the, the Harvard uh, Microsoft study that you, you referenced, that social connection is imperative. People need it more now than ever. Uh, my wife and I were on a conference call with the client yesterday. We did a, a Zoom call with her. And I, I told her as we were getting off, I said, as we got off the phone last time, my wife said, I really like her. She's like a wonderful person. I would like to be her friend. And we both started laughing. It's like, has it been that long since we've seen another human being? Um, we see each other. We see our cats, we see the dog, we see people from the window, but we don't go anywhere. We don't have that kind of interaction. Right. So people are starving for it. Now, think about the folks who work from home who didn't have the best relationship with the people in their household before the crisis. You're going to start seeing spikes in mental health issues. You're going to start seeing spikes in addiction issues. You're going to start seeing spikes in the, the, the newly woke people, the folks that now they have a little more work-life balance in some ways to, to you know, revolve around their kids, their pets, their schedule, their exercise. They don't want to go back to a three-hour-a-day commute like I always had when I worked in corporate America. Okay. Uh, they want to have something that looks like normal, and that's what sustainable becomes. Sustainable becomes some sort of new normal? Yes. Yes, and that's why I think, you know, like for a sprint, Anyone can sprint. Now, you might only be able to sprint 100 feet. Someone else might only be able to sprint 50 feet. But we can all give our very best sprint for a certain amount of time. But not everyone can run a marathon. That is the set distance. So the skills that you have to develop are skills and mindsets for marathon thinking. That What are the things that we can build into our resilience toolkit, if you will, that are sustainable, regardless if we're traveling or not, working from home, working from an office, if we're alone, if we're married and we have 18 kids in our home. Um, that's what I think sustainable. And I think about building that resilience. I think about the things that are dependent just on me, not necessarily dependent on all the other pieces falling into place. When I was looking at the Harvard Business Review article with Microsoft, one of the things that surprised me quite a bit, I don't know why it surprised me because Big Brother really is watching all the time, right, Scott? Especially when it comes to technology. One of the things that the data presented to them was how many hours, how many minutes people were active. I mean, anybody who's been on a webinar or run a webinar knows that little feature um, how actively somebody's listening, you know, are they on the main screen? Or are they doing something else in multitasking? I keep seeing with a number of people I've been working with, I've been coaching or whatever, 
their fears are that if they are not clicking something or doing something, that their boss is going to think that they should be terminated, that they're not working really hard, even if maybe they need to work on a piece of paper or something. That's not moving the mouse or clicking things because things shut down. Micromanaging has become sort of a default for a lot of managers now that never had work from home people. Cause you know, they used to be able to walk by the office or the cubicle and they'd see somebody and now they don't. So they're, they're constantly IMing them, wanting them to respond to a text, which is a distraction thing. So when you're talking about a marathon, how does that mindset begin to shift to make people managers and employees feel more comfortable that work is actually being done, progress is being made. I mean, there has to be some sort of planning and I'm not seeing a lot of that. I'm seeing a lot of reactivity versus planning. Yes, absolutely. Because as you said, while people may have worked from home occasionally or even much of the time, now everyone is working from home. So there's no set new norm. You add into uh, other clients I've had, like Microsoft, like um, AT&T Global, when you're on multiple time zones during project management, where um, you already had barriers built in. I think if we view the technology as an enabler, um, I, I, I still use this in a communication webinar or a, a workshop where a, a young new manager was at home on maternity leave And she sent an email to her whole team reprimanding them. And she said things like, I have my spies everywhere. I understand some of you are on IM all day long chatting with one another. Um, It's time to get back to work. And so that's very old school command and control, top down micromanagement. That is not going to survive much longer because while Big Brother might be able to see everything, managers can't necessarily see everything. And they're going to have to empower. One thing that was in that Harvard Microsoft study is that how more effective employees were when they had face-to-face or one-on-one contact with the manager to help set priorities, remove barriers, and to encourage and give feedback. The role of the manager is really that of a cheerleader, that of a motivator, and that of a coach. It's not big brother standing over your shoulder. So but yet have- so many have, have like, they never had that personality before. And now right. it's almost like they're in fear for their own existence. Yes. Yes. And, you know, we've all read that you should turn your car in the direction of a skid when you start to slide on ice and snow. Yet we do the opposite, right? We crank it because we overreact. And I think a lot of managers and a lot of us in our daily lives, when we feel like we're losing control in one part of our lives, it's incredibly natural to start micromanaging and tightening up. I can say this in my own life. I know that when I have been under huge amounts of stress, I start to fixate and get OCD about which way light switches go. And then I get (laughs) conscious of the fact that I'm fixating on this light switch is in the wrong direction as if there's a right direction. But it's I can't control this, I can't control this, I can't control this, but by golly, I am gonna control that damn light switch. Um, That's human nature, is that we try to wrest control back. The best managers are going to be the ones to see what the results are when they treat their employees with that respect. When they allow single tasking, you know, some organizations are now having meeting free Friday because employees, just like all of us, doesn't matter if we're working or a hobby, we work better in a distraction free environment for the most part. So if you have a block of time where you can get things done, um, that means no one's looking over our shoulder, no one's tapping you know, us to start paying attention to other things. Uh, studies will show that, that, you know, what we want to call multitasking is really doing many things poorly at the same time. Uh, we are really good at keeping our eyes focused on one thing, and, but our, our work economy seems to compensate those who can become selectively ADHD quicker. Like okay. I can go to this task and now drop this and get down to this. And that makes us a little crazy especially when we have so little things to hold on to. We, we don't even have the same cafeteria where we see the same people. 
Um, we don't have the same normal that we're used to having. So we're all going to, I think, find our new rhythm in how to do this effectively. Yeah, when you were just talking about that, you know, with the cafeteria and the people that we would see, I know that when I used to work corporate or when I went to events, when we had live events, right, live conferences, I always found that I got my best ideas in the hallways in on the way to the coffee shop, getting my cup of tea or a bottle of water or in the um, exhibition room, you'd run into somebody and you'd have this random conversation and it would sort of clear through the brain. And then, it, and then I go, Oh, I know how to do that now, but people don't have that. That's right. And we've got, Slack, we've got different IM, WhatsApp, uh, Messenger, this, that, uh, internal chats, Microsoft Teams, we've got Zoom, we've got all these different solutions. And I almost feel like they're not intimate enough. And people are using them to just throw stuff out and see what sticks against the wall. So now people have to sort through a lot more information so they're on kind of information overload in order to get to what's the piece of information that I actually need in order to move my project forward are are you seeing that with your clients and what would be your recommendation on how to perhaps shift that into the marathon versus this throw everything at something yeah when I look at it what's sustainable, um, we can't live on bread and water alone, right? So to try to just strip down the day to say, uh, for every 60 minutes, I'm going to be on the clock for 55. I'm going to be focused. I'm going to be production. And production. Um, I used to say, I am is for one purpose, short jokes. You know, I mean, sometimes we need planned levity. We need to be able to, as managers, to encourage other people to, um, intentionally break their uh, their thinking process because as you said it's it's the shower it's the bike ride it's the walk with the dog it's when we're reflecting upon something that's happened that we haven't had time to let go of it and let it just flow through our heads where we do some of our best thinking uh, managers can encourage that sort of thing um, I see a lot of groups are doing more things virtually where you're having virtual virtual social hours or coffee chats, where people are still encouraged to get into their little breakout rooms on Zoom calls and and talk to one another, because that is where a lot of creative energy starts to get built up, and where your passions, and and the things you've been thinking about, you have a sounding board. Right. Um, The best managers are not going to try to stifle that. They're going to actually find ways to encourage it and accelerate it. And what, what employees are... What we're finding with employees in that study, it referenced that employees are actually scheduling more of their own meetings to compensate for the fact that they don't have the social time they're used okay. to having. So they're, they're kind of social meetings versus meeting meetings. Yes. Yeah. And I say I would have like a walk and talk. I would, I would grab a cup of coffee in the morning and say, who wants coffee? And then anyone who wanted to walk around Grant Park in Chicago, we would just walk around and we would talk, we'd start our day. And it's whoever wants to come. It's just we're starting off task, but it's really on task because we're talking about what we're going to be focused on once we get back. You can create that same feeling with the technology. You can create the same feeling just by emailing, texting, IMing back and forth. And the the best leaders are the ones who know um, how much creative freedom to give their people. So they're still going to be responsible to get their work done. I think one of the things the article said is they're working longer hours to compensate for the fact that they're they're taking off during lunchtime to exercise, walk their dog, do something with their kids. Um, a lot of that is driven by guilt, right? I feel right. guilty that I'm not da 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 da. So now I'm going to make up for it. I think the best leaders are the ones that says, "Look, I plan on sleeping well tonight, and I want you to as well. Put in your best day you can." You're going to have some days that you're going to work two hours. Other days, you're going to work 12. Welcome to being salaried. You know, you know what's on your plate. Let me know how I can help you. Um, It's that type of respect I think we're looking for moving forward. So that's a mind shift for a a number of managers. 
what are some things they can begin to ask themselves? And, and this could be managers or in a corporate environment. It can be an entrepreneur with several employees underneath them or even virtual assistants that they may be working with. What are some questions they can to ask themselves to stop the reacting of going, maybe my employees aren't working. I need to go do this to say, take a breath. Well, if the data is suggesting that employees are adding time to their daily work schedules for the socialization. Um, that tells us how important it is. So maybe the question is, how can, how can managers help facilitate people with the social part? For example, you know, if I ask you, what do you look forward to? You know, what's on the horizon tomorrow, next week, next month? What would you tell me? What the are you show. looking for? The show. Perfect. And it's, it's scheduled. You know when it is. It's within your control as, as much as anything is. And it's up to you to run it to the best of your ability. So if, if that's something that you look forward to, what we understand from positive psychology research is that that positive anticipation releases endorphins, right? So if you have a manager and you ask an employee, hey, what's going on with you? What are you looking forward to? What's, what's going on with your week this weekend? That's how you make that personal connection. Then imagine if you come back the next time and you say, hey, you were going to take your kids to that water park. What did they think of it? Did you have fun? Anyone get any skin burn or did you use all your sun? I mean, just making those investments. And then I would ask a manager to look in the mirror and ask him or herself, how can I be the type of leader that my employees look forward to? How can I, how can I lead in such a way that they look forward to my involvement? instead of they cringe and look over the shoulder when I'm present. Okay. That's a really a, a wake up call question, I think. It, it, I think it really is a wake up call question. And the thoughts that went through my mind when you were saying that were, okay, number one, from somebody who owned a business with employees, the HR issues in it, right? How much can I share? What am I allowed to say? What will come back and bite me? And then the other side, the human element of me going, what if I were to share with one of my staff, oh, you know what I did the other day because I was completely stressing out and I was finding I wasn't effective. I took a walk and I called a friend and we FaceTimed as we walked so that we could share each other's walk yep. while we were together. I wonder, though, how because of some of the the restrictions, everybody's so worried about being sued or or something happening if there's some of that going on, even with staff, they don't want to necessarily say they took a walk or they did something or they're having construction done on their house or, or whatever. They, or maybe that they're afraid to say, I had a huge fight with my spouse or my kid. Yeah. And not every employee will want to divulge and that's okay. And not every leader has the type of personality where they even feel comfortable with it. So I would say within your own, I won't say comfort zone, because being a leader, it's not about you being comfortable. It's about helping your employees be comfortable. Okay. But it's about uh, with, within your culture, your corporate culture of uh, sharing the things. You know, if you're in an office, people might have pictures on their desk. They have pictures of their kids. You would think then that that's a safe question to ask. Oh, are those your children? How old are they? What are their names? We would do that naturally anyway. Look, I mean, right. doing Zoom calls, um, I cannot deny that I have kids or cats or dogs because they're usually running and bouncing all around. Well, uh, your cat people, walked across the screen with Jocelyn. Last yeah, time. right, right. I mean, some people maybe they have seen my, my wife walk naked behind me. I don't know. Maybe that's why my Zoom calls are uh, have gone up. And <laughs> but I mean, there is very little distance between home and work. And, and so we're opening ourselves up. And if people are comfortable with that, as a leader, you set the tone to say, listen, and I, I did this 20 years ago. And I came out of HR originally to say, I don't care if you work from home. I don't care if you work here. I don't care if you take four hours off during the day. Right. You know what's on your plate. You know what you're responsible for. So the expectations are owned by the employees and shared by the manager. Part of that respect is, look, I do my best work when I exercise first thing in the morning. 
You might want to go for a run at lunchtime, go shower and come back to work. However you get your work done, you know, I mean, that's that respect element. So if, if you tell your employees things like I went for a walk or I'm so glad I'm home because my kids both have dentist appointment today and my dog is going to the vet. I would never be able to do that if I had to drive an hour and a half to do right. It's it's telling people what is acceptable and what is appropriate. Um, no one asked for COVID-19, um, but people are given a benefit of less commute time. So I think there's a there's a balance, and we want to make sure that we're if we're looking at a marathon mindset, we're not going to nitpick about how fast they're going at every moment of the day. Instead, we're looking at them nurturing and feeding their own souls so they have the energy to be able to last the long, the long range. I, I think something well, you were just talking about, you know, the dentist appointments and the this and the walk, and it just hit me. I don't know why it just hit me. I think it was one of those, it's been festering for months now, but what you said just whoo, whacked me over the side of the head. Work from home is not the same as work from home used to be because the kids are home, the spouse is home, you're now getting groceries delivered. You, you can't just do the things you used to do. And that I think is something that many people haven't shifted on yet. My friends that have been doing work from home forever, their work from home is different, but they haven't altered their thinking around it. Because now their kids are running around the house. Some of them don't have offices where they can close a door. They're right. just in the kitchen. Like my upstairs, I had to get new AC. So I'm downstairs in my kitchen right now. Thankfully, I, I live alone, so I don't have to worry about it. But it's not where I would normally be. So setting things up is different. What's the mind shift that you're seeing? Or what are some things that people can do to get that moment. I mean, I'm hoping everybody out there that's listening right now, you get that you may be used to working from home, but you're not used to working from home now. This right. is different. Right. And, and I'll go back to the, the leader sets the expectation by granting permission, okay. by normalizing this shift. You know, the people that got to work from home five, 10 years ago, it was a gift. It was a benefit the company offered that we trust you enough. You can go work from home. Now it's a mandate. And, and like you said, it's a mandate that your spouse is there, that your kids are there, that you, you don't have a free moment. You don't have the privacy. You don't have the space. You, you, you can hear my doorbell ringing, microwave going off. Um, when I coach with executives, I'll say, where is HR on this? Drafting new guidelines. And I'd say guidelines, not policies guidelines of outlining your expectations that we realize that all of these things are changes right. that are not part of the typical work from home that you're used to. So we expect you to make allowances for that. We don't expect you to have the from 7 to 1130 without, no, you're going to have things popping up. Um, HR has to take a lead and the leader has to take a lead, I think, to give permission to say that as part of our culture, we want to take care of our employees and we want to take care of our customers, but we can't do anything without you. So it starts with you. Be compassionate and be kind to yourself. Take the breaks that you need. Know that we are here to help you, guide you, answer questions if we can for you. You know, we have, seem to have this mindset of banking and high tech and they're working 90 hours a week. And then the rest of the companies are like slappers, you know, like, you know, we can just kind of come and go. The reality of it is, None of us have experience in working during the pandemic. Uh, none of us have experience with a, an unemployed spouse with three kids at home and all the responsibilities that you now have added. So to say that I don't have a commute anymore, doesn't compensate. So as leaders, as, as HR organizations, I work with a lot of Sherm groups. I always encourage them. You should be taking the lead on setting what are the expectations during this transitional time? Because if you make this a new norm, that means when the kids are back in school, you know, you, you might have opened up a can of worms. But what you can say is this, in this time period, as long as this is all happening, we totally get it. But I would say if this does become a new norm, even after kids go back to school and things are normal, 
um, you're probably going to gain a lot of loyalty points from employees too, who understand that you gave to us. We're not going to screw you over. We're not going to take advantage of you. Google just announced that they're letting their employees, they want their employees to work from home till 2021. I mean, this isn't even a new normal. Like, I hate that phrase because I, I, I actually think that this has been building. These changes have been building for a long time. I mean, if you just look at the cost of living in Silicon Valley and San Francisco and some of these big tech hubs, it's gotten to a point where the salaries just, they're not feasible anymore because they don't even allow somebody to live in their own home. I mean, they're shared living spaces where you get a bunk and a, you know, a shared bathroom and a shared kitchen because the salaries can't even supply what the needs are. So I think it's been building and this has just accelerated it. And some people may disagree with me, but I've been watching this trend sort of happen. If that's the case, companies don't necessarily want to build a protocol for now, a procedure for now, and then have to change it. Is there some way to have a middle ground? I don't, I don't really know. I'm not even sure how to answer the, ask the question, Scott, but I feel like everybody's saying there has to be a COVID procedure. There has to be a new normal procedure and nobody's thinking about, as you said, sustainability. Right. How do we right. merge all of this, build resilience and say to everybody, forget that it's COVID, take a breath. Right. Right. What do we want? The, the challenge is, I, I don't know if you read, you know, Walmart their email to employees the other day saying, we're giving all of our associates off on Thanksgiving. We will not be open on Thanksgiving Day. Did you did you catch that? I, I did. And Target as well, supposedly is doing the same thing. And people have been talking about this for almost 10 years. Right. Right. And so you can look at it on one level and say, that's really nice of Walmart to give its employees time off because of where they've been there for us during this whole crisis. That's one piece of the message. The other part of the message is how good it felt to have a company or anyone in authority give some sort of a certain answer that it's not open to interpretation. Anything that comes out of the White House, the CDC, who, the, the, the experts, um, it's, it's constantly being questioned. Ever, okay. so it's, there's, there's no certainty. There's no absolute. So if I tell my kids, we are going to have dinner tonight at 530, and this is what we're having, and I actually deliver, I feel like, da, 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 and my kids are like, yay, truth, finally. Um, <laughs> organizations need to do a better job of making smaller promises and living living up to them. We, we have a, a credibility gap. We have a trust gap in our country right now. And yes, it's, it's bigger. To, it's easier to look at the governmental position and the big, you know, the big policy positions, but it's trickled down to everything because we don't have answers. So again, I'm, I'm a big person on guidelines as opposed to rules. Okay. But when we, when we tell people that uh, just like when you get onto an airplane or when, when you used to get onto an airplane, you put on your own mask. Why? Because if you don't, you can't take care of anyone else. And, and employees, if you don't take care of yourself, who's going to take care of your customers? And then if, if you don't, you're going to burn out. And then you're not going to be there for them. And then you're not going to be here. And, and then the worst thing that could happen is you could still show up to work, but you're doing less than your best. We want you to feel energized every day and not feel demoralized every day. So what are some of the best practices? I and mean, when I teach resilience and engagement, I talk about the things that are within your control, not about who's in the White House or what CDC says or any of those things. It's talking about looking forward to something positive, having positive anticipation in your life. So scheduling those things that you love. Okay, give some examples. Spending time rubbing up against the right people. We all know that there are some people that we spend five, 10 minutes doing FaceTime with or on the phone with, we laugh, we feel easier. Yeah. We like, oh, that was wonderful. And then there are people that it's like talking to an energy vampire. 
you know, if they had a theme song for their life, it would be, wah, wah. we know exactly what they're going to say. It's going to be negative and we're going to feel beaten up when we're done. So did you know that you have a choice to not pick up the phone when it's the, the energy vampire? Unless it's you your know, boss. Yes. Well, but you can be in the bathroom. You know, and I always say, like, sometimes you don't get to pick your teams. No, but you can decide if this is a good time for someone else's crisis. You know, so it's it's that regulation. And if I know I have to talk to my boss and I know it's going to be heated, I also have the time to pause, to take a deep breath, to choose my best intention of how I want to show up in this moment. Those are all resilience building techniques. Okay. Um, having a mantra. We, I think we all need a mantra. And you don't need a mantra if you're just running from a wolf that happens to chase you. But you do need a mantra if you are going to run intentionally for 26 plus miles. You know, you, you got to be able to tell yourself right foot, left foot, right foot, left. You have to have something that keeps you going. So a mantra for where you are in your life. What is your mantra? I think, you know, if you have 20 people listening to this right now, you're going to have some people who are going through a split up, a divorce, a separation. You're going to have some people who are caring for a sick child, a sick older parent, loved one. You're going to have someone struggling with addictions. You're going to have someone else who has a loved one that's struggling with addiction. You're going to have people struggling with mental health issues. Okay. We have all of this out here. So now what is it that we can do to combat all of those certainties? Well, we start looking at in the long term of how can I take away those parts and pieces? How can I be the compassionate kind of leader? As a leader, what mantra do your employees need? As someone listening on the radio show, what mantra do you need right now to get over that split up, to get over the addiction problem of a loved one, to get over a loss, to get over your fear? We have a, a mantra as a family. It's, it's when in doubt, love. You know, I don't have all the answers politically. I don't have all the answers medically. But instead of taking pot shots at someone else, what I can do is love. I can be tolerant. I can be as accepting as I can. And when I find myself being perpetually triggered, I can choose to block. I can choose to not take that phone call. I can choose to, again, repel uh, the things that are that are pushing back at me. So your, family, so mantra, so your family mantra is when in doubt, love. Yes. Okay. I'm yes. beginning to think that my mantra has been this too shall pass. I love that mantra. <laughs> I use that one all the time. Um, and, and the brilliance of it, and I'm sure you know this, but some of your listeners might not. We always say this power must have meant, well, this sucks. I can't wait for this to be done. So it won't last forever. It's terrible. This too shall pass. But he also meant it on the positive. When something is amazing, when something takes your breath away, you know, when, when something gives you goosebumps, Take a snapshot of that moment emotionally because this too shall pass. This isn't going to last forever. I remember just, uh, you know, bribing my three-year-old daughter to not take those long baths, but finally take a quick shower, get in, get out. Well, you know, it was no time after that that she stopped taking baths and she was all about the speed. And I then missed taking her out of the tub, drying her hair like I was buffing a car, giggling with her, making her hair stick straight up. Uh, when, when something is, is wonderful in the moment, try to learn to freeze on it and be mindful of it that, wow. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to miss this. I'm laughing because I love bats. And for as long as I can remember... I could spend hours in a bathtub and would randomly put more hot water in and, and stuff like that. And mom would always shout from another room, are you alive in there? Have you drowned? <laughs> <laughs> are you still there? Sometimes she would poke her head in and, and yeah, this yeah. occurred right up till mom passed away when we went back to living together. And today I'm, I have that memory still. Right. Every time I get in the bathtub with my book that I'm going to read or I still put bubble bath in, you know, and all of that, I keep listening to hear my mom say, are you still OK in there? Are you alive in there? Yeah. So, yeah, there's, you know, this too shall pass. She passed. But I still have that 
getting weepy here, still have that memory impregnated. And I took my mom, um, we, we called them, um, you know, the last show, the final road trip. We, we did it for a couple of years where I took her to see family members, some in Arkansas, some in California, and she had dementia and it kept getting progressively right. worse. And uh, in my hotel room, somewhere in California, I think, um, the bathroom lock didn't work. And I would lock and chain the door and I would put something underneath the door so my mom could not escape the room. Um, but I got into the shower and I'm not in there two minutes and my mom comes in, she pulls back the curtain and she's up said, oh, I just wanted to see what was in here. <laughs> and she closed the door and I laughed. And it wasn't two minutes later that she opened it again and she said, oh, this is the bathroom. And she pulled back the curtain. <laughs> Hi mom, still me. And, and what was in my mind is, as annoying as this is, she has the right. She saw me naked before. She's yeah. going to obviously yeah. see me naked now. That's her prerogative. But this this is going to pass. You know, yeah. this is one of those trips that we we did the road show as kind of a last hurrah to have her see people that she hasn't seen in 60 years, for, for her to be loved on by, by family members. And any situation that you're in, you know, yes, you can constantly fixate on, oh, it's so hot out here. Well, this too shall pass. What are you going to say this winter? You know, boy, I, <laughs> you know, it's take advantage of things while they're there and lock into it. And I, I love that mantra because it fits no matter what's going on. in your life. Well, when you think of it in terms of work, right, and what's going on, the way I look at it as the the craziness of COVID at some point will just become the usual. And what if instead of worrying about, well, I can't wait for this to end, you say, okay, well, this could be the way it's always going to be going forward. So how do we want to do business? How do we want to be as human beings? How do we want to work from home? How do we want our employees to work from home? I don't feel like anybody's there yet. And I feel like we need to be there. You know, the government's not there. This is not a political show, but, you know, the government's not there. The CDC is not there. No world government is there. I think the closest world government that possibly has gotten there was New Zealand, you know, because she's just sort of thinking about, well, what if this is all we've got? Yep. Um, but I don't even know that for sure, because the only information I get is what the news chooses to show me, right? Right. Do you think that that is a useful, you know, from all of your experience as a crisis counselor, from um, helping businesses thrive and shift and pivot and all, you know, you are the leadership therapist, right? Would it be helpful for us to go, let's just accept this, move on and go, how do we want our business to look? If it changes again, it changes again. But I can't imagine that restaurants accepting that people may never want to come into their restaurant the same way, that if they were to begin to think now about their business, about how bars would work, that those would not be the ones that are thriving. Right. But nobody's thinking that way. They're just like, how do I get through? You know, interesting to go back to the article, bars and church, what do they have in common? Um, they're social. They're, they're not mandatory. They're affinity based. You know, um, you go to a bar because like you, I like to drink. You know, we're all in this together for one purpose, to drink. You go to church because we want to worship or we want to believe the same way. We want to be around like-minded individuals. I think organizations too are going to go through those shifts. The ones that are able to create loyal employees in this process, I believe no matter what their core business is or does or evolves into, they're going to have the greatest differentiator at the other side. Husk Barna has been around since the 1500s. Um, you probably have some of their products, like, for example, a musket that they produced or uh, Sweden. No, I mean, they, they started off as an armor. You know, they made right. muskets right. for right. the army, uh, but they're not known for that today. Does that mean they're out of business? 
No, but but no one that was part of that first hiring wave back in the 1500s is still on the payroll. Uh, they went through multiple iterations and they're still fine. Why? They, they've always been able to find innovation and great employees and great execution. And, and that's this new world set. Uh, you know, reading about one local business here where they had a restaurant, they're open for breakfast and lunch. Well, they wanted to be more to the community. So instead of just doing that, what they started doing is looking at their wares they had in the cooler and say, why don't we sell tomatoes? Why don't we sell some? So that they've actually increased their business by becoming a local corner market right. in the process. So does that mean they'll never make sandwiches again? No. It means they're, they're meeting a need that's in a niche that's been created today. Think about all the different, you know, uh, Etsy eBay, all the companies that were created overnight to manufacture masks, something that you only wore at Halloween, you know, prior to this right. crisis. Right. So there are going to be opportunities in this for those that adjust quickly and those that can help their employees understand that we're still going to need some of the same skills and the same talents. Um, as the, 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 the ship starts to course correct a little bit. I don't know that we can say definitively that this now is just the way it is. But what we can say is uh, this has been a year that's unprecedented for a lot of reasons. Um, we have seen things that haven't been seen for a hundred years. And uh, it's kind of a perfect storm in a lot of ways. Uh, I, I can say that my last big opportunity happened 2008. Uh, there was fear that the, the White House was going to turn insurance companies into third-party administrators, just, you know, clerks. Right. And so the C-suite turned over. I'm executive chief of staff. I report to the person, not to the role. So I leave with the C-suite. Um, that led me to writing books. That led me to meeting Jocelyn, who was a fantastic editor. I, I jokingly say that she was expensive, so I had to marry her. Uh, that's a joke. <laughs> that's not the only reason I married her. But um, but that led me to coaching. That led me to consulting. That led me to speaking. And now, guess what? I'm not doing. I'm not speaking. I'm not. I'm not out there traveling. So so what that means is I'm doing much more of this. I'm doing much more of the virtual. I'm doing much more of the coaching and the consulting. I'm doing much more of the creative work right now, but I'm also looking at it and saying that it's sort of like that old joke about two hikers encountering a bear on the trail. And one sits down immediately and starts putting on tennis shoes and tying them. And the other guy said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to, I'm going to run. And he said, you can't outrun a bear. And he said, I know, but, I can't outrun you. Uh, and, and that it's, it's survival. It, it's not in a selfish way. It's like, if I can keep my head right now, if I can keep busy and keep looking for the smaller opportunities, I'll be a, a rarity that's ready to go and will have learned lessons on the other end that I can translate anywhere else. And, and that's what I would like companies to start thinking is it's, you don't have to necessarily change your whole product or your whole service delivery model. It's a matter of how can you be what's needed today? And how can you get your employees on board with that? And the biggest factor of that, of course, is communication. Companies of every size are not great at it. That's the next opportunity for, for leaders and managers. Get really good at communicating, even if you're just checking in to say, nothing new to report, but I just wanted to let you know that. That is so critical with all the ambiguity going on right one of the things that I've seen with some managers based on what you just said is they're almost not managing. They're micromanaging and not managing. And I'm putting a little differentiation there and based on you nodding your head. And for those of you who are listening just on podcasts with the audio only go, go to you, my YouTube channel or, or go to Facebook live or on the website. And you can see, cause Scott was nodding his head when I was talking about this idea of, not managing, but micromanaging. I feel like some leaders have forgotten that there is a difference between the two, that right now we need to even just sort of forget the word manage and shift even more to the word lead. 
I mean, your company is Lead to Engage, which, by the way, everybody, great website, leadtoengage.com, lots of great resources out there as well. But what for you is something that whether you are an employee, you're an entrepreneur, you are in management, you're a CEO of a Fortune 100 company, what is really critical in leading to help people stop micromanaging, which typically prevents forward motion? Yeah. Well, what I said at the top of the hour is, you know, what is it that I as a leader look forward to? And what is it that I can do as a leader that other people will look forward to? I want them to look forward to me. What do I have to do? Um, No one looks forward to a micromanager. No one. What they do look forward to is someone like uh, coaching with a uh, a friend, uh, associate the other day. He's been put into a new role, very large organization. And he said, I have three things. This is my last job before I retire. I want to be competent in it. I want to make sure that I can do this job before I say yes. I want to make sure that my boss is going to be thrilled with me for doing this job. And I want all my employees and team members to have fun while doing it. You know, that's not a micromanager. That's have the end in mind. I want success. I want others to see that it's successful. Why? Because my credibility as a leader comes from that vicariously. Other people say, wow, you nailed it. But also people have fun. And it's what we were talking about offline. We will pay money to bowl, which is mind numbing. You know, I say that because obviously I'm not a good bowler, right? But we will pay money to throw a ball down really long, thin pieces of wood to knock down 10 pins. You have two tries. It's not that exciting, really. Uh, it's a game, but we pay money to do it. But we pay money to do it because we're we're telling jokes with people. We're having a beer with okay. people. We're having pizza with people. We're keeping score. We have side wagers. We're mocking. We're teasing. The best leaders are all about how you make people feel in the process. So what is it that you need to do and become so that other people's crave, other people crave your leadership? Okay. That's, that's the question I think leaders should best ask themselves right now. And it's never going to be micromanaging. You know, I asked that question several times throughout our time together today in different ways because I feel like we keep getting to another level of that conversation. And I know one of the things that you are really great at, and and Jocelyn as well, is the whole idea of reflection and taking time to pause. Is that um, I feel it's a big part of resiliency and something that people are not doing right now because there's so many things being thrown at them that we're not taking time to pause. And we've talked a little bit about that, but I'm afraid that people aren't giving themselves permission to pause, that leaders aren't giving staff permission to pause. But beyond that, like my friend that I told you about at the beginning of the show, he's not giving himself permission to pause. Right. What do you what do you say? I would say to your friend, does your friend feel like he can go to his or her boss and say, can I have permission to try to intentionally bring more balance into what I'm doing? Here's what I want. You know, like right now I'm working these hours. I'm taking these responsibilities. I'm doing this. Um, I love getting on my road bike and getting out. It's hot in the afternoon, so I like to do it first thing in the morning. Would it be okay if I start my day making that investment in my health and my, by clearing my head and I'm, I'm working every morning by blank? It, it's a simple question. The answer is obvious. No boss would say, no, you can't, you know, it, it's, but, but having the conversation I think brings clarity to your friend too. To say, but what if he's afraid to have it? Well, then it's, um, it's, what, where's that fear coming from? Okay. You know, what, what is it? And I'll tell you from research, uh, there's something called the ARC model. Um, What we value the most and what we want to be rewarded and what we are most threatened by is when our autonomy is threatened. Autonomy, the opposite of that is I'm going to micromanage you. Okay. And our relatednesses. So when how other people view me, 
How do I fit in here? Am I looked up to? Am I looked down on? And the, the third one is competence. Do you know your stuff? Are you good at what you do? So being new in a job, you, you want to keep your autonomy. You don't want to be micromanaged. You want your boss to think nice things of you, to give you more respect. So your relatedness is, this is my person who can do all of these things. And finally, you're competent. That's why I chose you. So he's probably feeling threatened that okay. that would happen. So by acknowledging that threat, by pausing, by stating it, and then to reflect that back to the boss to say, look, I know I'm, in, I'm new in this position and you've given me a lot of autonomy and I feel like I've made good inroads with the team and the projects. Uh, and I don't want you to think that I'm burning out or I'm not competent. I'm highly committed. I'm highly suited for this type of work. Here's something that I think I could use more of. And that is a little more time. And I think I look at me as an example. When I when I stopped traveling, I had to decide: is it time to go to my old standby called comfort food, which essentially puts you into a carb coma, so you pass <laughs> out on the couch watching TV uh, and then going to sleep, and you'd wake up not feeling rested, so you can worry and start the whole process again? Or should I invest in me physically? And that's what I did. I started walking. The walking became jogging. The jogging became running. Now it's alternating between running and being on my road bike. Why? I'm making an investment in me because if I don't keep my head straight and clear, which again is another tip for building resilience, is building that physical resilience. It's, it's proven by research that physical exercise where you're getting your heart rate up 20 minutes a day at a sustained high level after six months is more effective at combating depression than just taking an antidepressant. So both have good results up to six months, but after six months, the Prozac starts to decline in its efficacy, but the physical exercise keeps your head clear. And I had to decide, what do I want to invest in? More pharmaceuticals or counseling, which sometimes we need that. I've I've been there myself. Or do I want to invest in doing my part to build my own resilience by getting off the couch and investing that time I would, providing comfort to myself by building my personal resilience? And I. I get up every morning and I get on that bike and I go for my long ride and that helps me to keep my head clear. That's that's a perfect way to end the show, Scott. Other than please share how people can reach out to you because I mean you've shared so much great advice. I mentioned the website lead to engage.com, but what's the best way for people to get additional help? Yeah, you can go there, you can use my contact information on that site. You can email me at scott at lead to engage.com. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Start a conversation with me there. I, I blog. I share videos. Uh, usually it's a combination of things that are going on personally that also have a work-related theme because I think whatever we can learn and reinforce in one environment, it transfers very readily to the next. And I know you're also doing um, web-based keynotes and coaching and classes and yes. stuff like that. So people can talk to you about perhaps doing some of that to help their leaders. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for being here. This is exciting. I finally got you on the show. Absolutely. I've been looking forward to this. Thank you, Laura. It's been fun. I've had to been able to get people on the show that have been so road warrior that they've not been able to spend an hour to do the show. And now I'm like, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Thank goodness for unemployment. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Thank goodness for a shift in the way we do business. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, everybody, I hope you took a lot of great information from here. If you're listening to us live, you can always catch it on podcast anywhere on your favorite podcast platform up on the YouTube platform or the recording on Facebook Live. No matter what you do, remember the right questions can change your life. So what are you asking today? Have a great day, everyone. You've been listening to It's All About the Questions, starring Laura Stewart. Connect with Laura at itsallaboutthequestions.com and download a free workbook that will help you ask better questions starting today.